Our highest assurance of the goodness of providence seems to me to rest in the flowers. All other things, our powers, desires, food, are really necessary for our existence. But this rose is an extra. Its smell, its color, are an embellishment of life, not a condition of it. It is only goodness which gives such extras. And they shine like stars in our world of shadows where treachery and betrayal are the currency of life, driving poor human beings into madness and despair. The Naval Treaty by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Dramatized for radio by David Ashton. With Clive Medicine as Sherlock Holmes and Michael Williams as Dr. John Watson. And featuring Patrick Malahide as Percy Phelps. With Joanna Myers as Annie Harrison and Stephen Tompkinson as Joseph Harrison. The Naval Treaty. God. God. Percy, hush now, my dear. Sorry. Translate from the French. Hush, hush, hush. Despair. There, there, there. Rest, rest, my dear. Now calm yourself. How is he? Trust in me. Why ring the bell? Why? Uh, honey. Hush, hush, my dear. Hush, I'm here. There now. Now rest yourself. There, rest. Rest. Oh, God. Thank you. It's you that ought to rest, Annie. Oh. Why don't you try to get some sleep? I'll look after him for a while. A position of trust in the papers. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, we'll find them. Never fear. No. No. I rather think not. I rather think not. <sighs> oh, oh, praise the Lord. I think the fever's broke, Joseph. Eh? Hello, Annie. Uh, hello. Where am I? Well, we put you in Joseph's room. And I'd like it back, please. Oh, shush uh, you. <laughs> it's not even your house. Oh. Well, now, Percy Phelps, you've had me worried near to death. What have you got to say for yourself? I would like pen, Annie. Pen and paper. I have to write to an old friend. It was in the month of July, immediately succeeding my marriage, when I received Phelps' letter. There was something so pitiable in his appeals, a sense of such despair. My wife agreed with me that not a moment should be lost in laying the matter before Sherlock Holmes. And so, within an hour of breakfast time, I found myself back once more in the old rooms in Baker Street. You come at a crisis, Watson. Oh. Yeah, I dip this paper in. If it remains blue, all will be well. But if it turns red, then a man's life is at stake. Uh, yeah. Thought as much. Colour of blood, eh? Mm. Uh, I shall be at your service in an instant. Two telegrams and the matter is finished. May I read the letter to you? Yeah, yes, by all means, my dear chef. The house address is Briar Bray Woking. <clears throat> and my dear Watson, I have no doubt you can remember Tadpole Phelps, who was in the fifth form when you were in the third. Possibly even you may have heard that through my uncle's influence I obtained a good appointment at the Foreign Office until a horrible misfortune came suddenly to blast my career. The foreign Office, eh? That's a pretty clever of fish. Do you think you could bring your friend Mr Holmes down to see me? I should like to have his opinion of the case, though the authorities assure me that nothing more can be done. That's authorities always will. Uh, must get these to the page, boy. Uh, leave me for a moment, Watson. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, of course, of course. Hmm. I dare not think of it too much. Fear of a relapse. Oh, poor fellow. Still so weak, I have to communicate, as you see, by dictating. Do try and bring him your old schoolfellow, Percy Phelps. 
Uh, the end of a very commonplace little murder. Hmm? There's something better there, I fancy. Let me see the rest of it. Certainly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doesn't tell us very much, does it? No, hardly anything. Mm. Yet the writing is of interest. But the writing is not his own. Precisely. So your friend is in close contact with someone who, for good or evil, has an exceptional nature. Then you will take the case? My interest is already awakened. <laughs> and if you're ready, we'll start at once for Woking to see this diplomatist who's in such an evil way and the lady to whom he dictates his letters. Well, I must say, Watson, marriage doesn't seem to be harming you greatly. You're as plump as a Christmas goose and it's only July. Well, not plump, Holmes, not plump. But I, uh, I enjoy a good meal at home. Do you now? You're always welcome to come over and partake. No, no, thank you. No, I'll leave you to your wedded bliss. Hmm. So, Tadpole Phelps. Hmm. 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 Not a particularly flattering sobriquet. Shape of his head at the time. Hmm. But there was plenty in it. He won every prize at school hmm, and a scholarship to Cambridge. The uncle he referred to in his letter is Lord Holdhurst. Yeah, the present foreign minister. Mm. Yeah, very well, very well connected, you're Mr. Phelps. No, it didn't do him much good at school, though. We used to chevy him about the playground and hit him over the shins with a wicket because of it. What monsters little boys can be. We were quite big boys. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Holmes and Dr. Watson, it must be. Welcome to Briarbrae. Ah, Percy's been in a fine old state waiting, poor chap. He clings to any straw. <clears throat> His father and mother asked me to look out for you. The mere mention of the subject. Very painful for you. You yourself are not a member of the family, I perceive. Eh? Oh, <laughs> the J.H. monogram on me locket. Ah, for a moment, I thought you'd done something clever. No, a mere perception. Oh, don't mind me, I just rattle on. I'm an Iron Master's son, you see. J.H. <laughs> Joseph Harrison, Northumberland, born and bred, at your service. <laughs> ah, my sister Annie was to marry, well, is, I suppose, Percy. She came down to meet his folks and I tagged along as a sort of escort. But then his crash happened. Ah, she's nursed him hand and foot these two months. What a time we've had of it. You have stayed on also. Aye. Well, I wanted to keep close, and if need be, I can always nip up to town for business. Are you in the iron trade? <laughs> no fears. My father wouldn't let me near it. Stocks and shares, sir. Stocks and shares. They, too, can be subject to crashes. <laughs> can they not? <laughs> oh, but nothing as bad as what happened to poor old Percy. Anyhow, we can't stand here nattering. I'll take you to them. I know how impatient he is. Come along, gentlemen. So saying, he bustled us up the path, into the house, and then to the room where Phelps awaited us, lying upon a sofa near an open window, through which came the rich scents of the garden and the balmy summer air. He was like a shadow of a man. Joseph Harrison left immediately, but the sister stayed at Phelps' insistence. She sat with a hand in that of the invalids and fixed her eyes upon him almost hypnotically as Phelps plunged without preamble into his story. I was a happy and successful man, Mr. Holmes. Fine career, about to be married. But this sudden and dreadful misfortune has wrecked all my prospects in life. We shall be married, Percy. Have no fear of that. You said in your letter you were in the Foreign Office. Yes, after Cambridge. I did well. Before long, I had a position of some responsibility. When my uncle, Lord Heldhurst, became minister, he gave me several missions of confidence, which I successfully concluded. He came to trust me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, nearly ten weeks ago, on May the 23rd, he called me into his private room and said that he had a new commission for me, one of the gravest importance. He then took from his bureau a grey roll of paper. What I hold here is the original of a secret treaty between England and Italy. Now, I need not tell you, Percy, that the French and Russian embassies would pay out an immense sum to learn the contents of this. And these papers should not leave me were it not necessary to have them copied. You have a special desk in your office? Yes, sir. Hmm. 
Remain behind when the others go, so that you do this without being overlooked. When you have finished, lock the original and the draft in your desk and hand them over to me personally tomorrow morning. You were alone during all this? Yes. Near to any door or window? No, in the centre of the room. And you spoke low? Both of us. Hmm. Thank you. Pray, go on. I did exactly as instructed. Worked on alone. When I saw the contents of the treaty, I realised that my uncle had not exaggerated its importance. I know you cannot go into details, but... Uh... Part of it foreshadowed the policy which this country would pursue in the event of the French fleet gaining a complete ascendancy over that of Italy in the Mediterranean. And I think we used to hit you over the shins with a wicket. Oh, if that were my only problem, Watson. Oh, the naval treaty. It was a long document, 26 separate articles, all written in the French language. By nine o'clock, I was barely a third of the way through. I'd been anxious to hurry, you see, because I knew that Joseph was travelling back to Woking by the eleven o'clock train, and I'd hoped to join him, but gave up on that idea. Oh, I feel so drowsy, stupid. Coffee, that's what I need. Uh, I, I rang the bell for the commissioner. He makes coffee in the little lodge at the foot of the stairs. Coffee, that's what I need. Oh, Miss Tangy, I was expecting your father. I was downstairs when you rang, sir. Thought I'd save his legs. I see. Could you please ask him to make me a cup of coffee? Uh, strong. I'll tell him. Uh, Miss Tangy, you, um, do this floor, do you not? And all the other ones. Yes, well, it's, it's just that the top of that filing cabinet over there appears to have been gathering dust for over a month now. It's a very tall cabinet. Perhaps a longer feather duster? I'll do it tonight, sir. No, not tonight, Tomorrow evening will be fine. So, it's just a coffee, sir. Uh, strong. I'll tell him. Oh. I wrote two more articles. Felt more drowsy than ever. Where was my coffee? Ages I've wasted. Shh, not Percy. I opened the door. Looked down the corridor. No one. Down the stairs. Dimly lit. Commissioner's Lodge at the bottom. Tell you. Uh, 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 Mr. Phelps, uh, uh, sorry. I came to see if my coffee was ready. Now, where the devil is it? Oh, I, I was boiling a kettle for you, sir. I, uh, I, <coughs> I must have fallen asleep, sir. Sorry. Uh, oh, but, Mr. Phelps. Yes? But it's the bell, sir. The bell? Yes, sir. If you was here. Who rang what it? What are you saying, man? What bell? The bell of the room you was working in, sir. Oh, my God! Oh, no. No! The copy still on my desk, but the original vanished. <laughs> it was as if a cold hand had tightened and... Now, calm yourself, The love. details, Mr. Phelps. Concentrate your mind upon the details. Yes. Halfway down the staircase, another flight leads off down to a side door which opens out into Charles Street. It's used by the clerks as a shortcut when coming from there. The thief must have used it also. Otherwise, I should have met him on the main stairs. Could he not have concealed himself in your room or perhaps the corridor? Dimly lit, you said. No, a rat could not have hit in either place. Uh, so pray continue. Well, the commissioner and I ran down the side stairs. The door to Charles Street was closed but unlocked. We rushed out into the street. I distinctly remember the chiming of a church bell. Quarter to ten. That may be of enormous importance. Go on. Dark night, thin warm rain falling, cobbles wet and slippery in the lamplight. No one on the street. Nearby in Whitehall you could hear the sound of traffic and people, but here was nothing, nothing. Just the rain falling and us running. At the corner we found a policeman. Robbery. A, a robbery has been committed. Mm. A document stolen. Ha has anyone passed this way? Just the one person, sir. A, a small woman with a paisley shawl. That would be my door. No one else? No one. Well, which way did the woman turn? I had no reason to notice, sir. How long ago? Within the last five minutes. Tell you where do you live? Uh, 16 Ivor Road, Brixton. But please, Mr Phelps, don't be drawn on a false saint. My daughter has nothing to do with all this. It was pointless to pursue further. We returned to the office. The policeman informed Scotland Yard, and then we made a thorough search of stairs and passages. Without result. One thing, though. 
The corridor to my room was laid with a kind of creamy linoleum, which shows an impression very easily, but there was no trace of any footmarks. It had been raining all evening. Since about seven. So, no marks then. Though the night was wet. Interesting, don't you think, Watson? Mm. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, it's intriguing. Mm. Well, what happened next? The room was examined minutely. No secret doors. The window's 30 feet up. Whoever stole the treaty could only have come through that door. Silently, stealthily, like a thief in the night. And yet the bell was rung. There you have me. No traces of the intruder. Cigar ends, dropped glove, hairpin, that sort of trifle. No, there was no clue of any kind. The only tangible fact was that the commissioner's daughter had been seen hurrying away from the place. Oh, by this time we'd been joined by a detective from Scotland Yard, Mr Forbes, and he took up the case with great energy. We called up a handsome bundled tangy into it, and within half an hour we were sitting in the front room of their house, waiting for the daughter to arrive. I wouldn't raise your hopes too high, Mr Phelps. Even if she did take it, she could have dropped it off anywhere along the way. But she doesn't know that we're waiting for her, does she? Ah, yeah. You might have a point there. Shh. Father, why don't you work? I've been brought. There are two men in the parlour waiting to see you, my dear. No! The fool, he's warned uh, She must be in the kitchen. There's nowhere else. Listen, easy. There's no need. My dear. Why don't you leave me alone? Oh, oh Mr Phelps, what are you doing here? Now, come, come, my lady. Who did you think we were? I, I thought you were the brokers. You've had some trouble with the tradesmen. That's not quite good enough, I'm afraid. You must help the gentleman, my dear. We have reason to believe that you have taken a paper of importance from the Foreign Office. You must come back with us to Scotland Yard, where you will be searched. No! I can't leave my father. Oh, it'll be all right, my dear. It's always the poor gets the blame. He's never liked me. I have nothing against you. Just because of a little bit of dust. Oh, don't make a fuss, Lizzie. Come on, will you? No, I won't do it. You most certainly will. We examined the kitchen to make sure she had not burned or secreted the papers in the instant she was alone, but there was nothing. So... Immediately to Scotland Yard with her to be handed over to the female searcher. There was no sign of the papers. Watson here would tell you, Mr Holmes, I was a sensitive, nervous boy at school. Mm. It's my nature. I fancy I made a scene. Lost control over myself, Lord knows. By the time I reached home, I was practically a raving maniac. Yes, I wanted to do. When your parents and I saw you, oh, you gave us such a fright. Shame on you. Yes, indeed. Shame. Shame on me. We had to bundle Joseph out of here. He still complains of it, so... ..says the mattress where he sleeps now has more lumps than a bag of coal. Yes. <laughs> this became my sick room. Miss Harrison has looked after me by day and a hired nurse by night. Until I recovered, I could not be left alone for one moment. Yes, brain fever is, um... <clears throat> ..not an easy thing to get to grips with. Most true. Uh, so, no sign, no trace, even now. Uh, one would have thought. Uh, did you tell anyone of this uh, confidential task? No. Not even Miss Harrison here, for example? Oh, most certainly not. Uh, none of the staff under you knew of it? None. Mm. Do you know any more of this fellow Tangy? Only that he's an old soldier. What regiment? Uh, Coldstream Guards, I ah, believe. Uh, thank you. Well, no doubt I can get any other necessary facts from your Mr Forbes. Ah! What a lovely thing a rose is. Yeah, it's a moss rose, I believe. Uh, uh, may I pick it? Of course. Yeah. How delightful. <laughs> Our highest assurance of the goodness of providence seems to me to rest in the flowers. All other things, our powers, desires, food, are, are really necessary for our existence, but this rose... It's an extra. Its smell, its its colour are an embellishment of life, not a condition of it. It is only goodness which gives such extra. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Holmes, do you see any prospect of solving this mystery? <coughs> ah, the mystery. Yes. Do you see any clue? You have so far furnished me with seven. Y you suspect someone? I suspect myself. Uh, what? Of coming to conclusions too rapidly. Then go to London and check your conclusions. Mm. Excellent <laughs> advice, Miss Harrison. I think, Watson, hmm? we cannot do better. Come along! <laughs> Go to London and check your conclusions. 
Strong character, that woman. Yeah. Mm, very good sort, unless I'm mistaken. Yeah. <laughs> uh, beautiful day. There's something about a summer's day always brings out the philosopher in me. Seem to have missed out on lunch somehow. Watson, look down there. Hmm? No. Clapham Junction. Look at those clumps of buildings rising like brick islands in a lead-coloured sea. The board schools. Oh, lighthouses, my boy. <coughs> Beacons of the future. Capsules with hundreds of bright little seeds in each, out of which will grow a wiser and better England. I suppose the man Phelps does not drink. <coughs> no, I doubt it. Mm, so do I. Ha <laughs> yes, yes, yes. The hunt is on, Watson. Well, my practice... Uh... Mm, thus spoke the respectable married man. Well, if you think your cases are more interesting than mine... I was about to say my practice can get along very well for a few days. Slack time of year. Oh. Ah, well, excellent then. Hmm. We shall uh, pull together. <clears throat> you said you had some clues. Yes. This is not a purposeless crime. Who is it that profits from it? Well... The Russians, the French, and whoever might sell the treaty to them. And then there's Lord Holdhurst. Him? Politics. Mm, murky business, Watson. Mm. Meanwhile, what do you think of this? <clears throat> oh, ten pounds reward. Cab, which dropped a fare at the door of the Foreign Office in Charles Street. Quarter to ten in the evening of May the 23rd. Apply 221B Baker Street. Hmm. I was wondering about that. Great minds think alike, so we reason. If the thief came from outside on so wet a night, yet left no muddy or damp marks upon linoleum, examined within a few minutes of his passing... It is more than probable he came in a cab. Yes, yeah, a safe deduction. One of the clues I spoke of. Then uh, there's the bell. Why did the thief ring? Bravado was someone else there who wished to prevent the crime. Was it an accident? Or was it? Was it? He sank back into a state of intense and silent thought. We soon reached the terminus, and after a very hasty luncheon, Holmes wired the evening papers with the advertisement, and then we pushed on to Scotland Yard. I've heard of your methods before now, Mr. Holmes, and I'm not sure I approve of them. Uh, your approbation, Inspector Forbes, makes no difference to me one way or the other. But if you wish this investigation to go further, you will work with me and not against. Uh, well, to be truthful, I've certainly had no credit from the case so far. What steps have you taken? Uh, Tangy, the commissionaire, has been shadowed these nine weeks, no result. He's been off work the last two days, a summer chill, according to the daughter. His record in the guards? Uh, left with a good character, but she, now I fancy she knows something of this. She's hiding something. Hmm. What explanation did she give of answering when Phelps rang for coffee? Her father was tired. She wished to relieve him. Yes. Why she hurried away that night? Later than usual, wanted to get home. But she arrived after you. A difference between a bus and a hansom, she said. Why did she run into the back kitchen? Because she had the money there with which to pay the brokers. Mm. Seems to have an answer for everything. Mm. She could, of course, merely have let someone in through the side door in Charles Street. Yes, have you formed any theory of why the bell was rung? No, I must confess, it beats me always. Yeah, it seems a queer thing to do, was it not? Well, thank you for your help, Inspector. Uh, where are you off to now? Uh, we may take a little trip to Brixton eventually, but first we are going to interview with a possible future Premier of England. Ah, my unfortunate nephew. I fear the incident must have a very prejudicial effect on his career. If the treaty reached, uh, let us say, the French or Russian Foreign Office, you'd expect to hear of it, I presume. I most certainly should. Ten weeks have elapsed, and yet for some reason the treaty has not fallen into their hands. Well, I can't suppose the thief took it to frame it and hang it up. Perhaps he's waiting for a better price. Or perhaps the thief has had a sudden illness. Like an attack of brain fever, for example? You're sure you don't want your sleeping draught, Percy? I can do without it, I think. And I may release the nurse for tonight? Most certainly. I shall need no companion except for Morpheus. Morpheus? Yes. I shall sleep in the arms of Morpheus. 
Oh, you must be getting better. You're talking like a Cambridge man again. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, Annie. Oh, Lizzie, I'm burning, burning. Shush, Dad. It'll be all right. Oh, what is it now? Shush, Dad, quiet now. Oh, all right, all right. Miss Elizabeth Tanky. Who are you? My name is Sherlock Holmes. Oh, wait, Dad! What do you want? Uh, your father is ill, is he not? My friend here is a doctor. Perhaps he can help. Oh, please. I, I won't harm him, I promise you. Oh, come in. Come in. Thank you. Oh, he's fallen. Oh. Dad! Take his feet, Holmes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, let's have a look at you. Mm. This looks like a case of malaria. It is. You have some pills for him? Yes, these, but I don't give him any more. There, there, old chap. Rest. There's a good fellow. You're not the police, are you? No, but I rather think that we have a few things to discuss. He caught the disease when he was abroad with the guards. So, the night of the theft, when he was asleep. He'd just recovered from another bout a few days before. If his employers found out that he was subject to these attacks... They'd fire him like a shot. Yeah. Well, things are hard enough as it is. So, this is what you've been hiding, defending so vigorously. I never took that paper, Mr Holmes. I love my country. My father lost his health in the service of it. We may be poor, but we're not traitors. You must believe me. Coming, Dad. Excuse me, gentlemen. Yes, yes. Hmm. Do you believe her, Holmes? Oh, yes, yes. I'm quite certain that she did not do it. Then who the devil did? My God. there? Who are you? Help! Help! Help, please! Someone! Help! The next day, Holmes and I travelled down to Woking in the early afternoon. When we arrived at the house, the brother and sister were together in the sick room with Phelps, and there was an air of barely suppressed excitement and fear in the place. Perhaps we've more to tell you than you have us. Really? Yeah, we've had an adventure during the night. Well, pray, let us hear it. Well, last night was the very first I had slept without a nurse in the room. About two in the morning, I'd sunk into a light sleep, but suddenly I was awakened by a noise. It was a sharp click, a metallic sound from the window. We found out later somebody had forced the catch back. Oh, oh, quiet, Joseph. Let Percy tell it. The window was slowly opened. I saw a man, at least I, I think it was a man, crouching, then gone in a flash. He wore some sort of cloak which came across the lower part of his face. He, he had a long knife in his hand. I feared he may have been trying to kill me, Mr Holmes. But why? I don't know. Perhaps some um, wide conspiracy? Yes, perhaps, but a, a knife has many uses. Dear me, he was safer at school, Phelps. What happened next? I was not strong enough to follow him. I shouted. Shouted again, or eventually the whole household came tumbling in. Joseph and the groom found some marks on the flower bed under the window. Ah, but the weather's been so dry, there was no trail. But I tell you what I did find, Mr Holmes. There's a wooden fence in the grounds that hangs close to the road. Now, the top of one of the rails had been snapped off. I reckon the fellow scraped his way over there and made off up the road. Though I'm no great detective, I admit. You seem to have done very well. Ah. Mr. Phelps, do you think you could uh, walk around the house with me? Oh, yes, I should enjoy a little sunshine. I'll come as well. I can show you the fence. Uh, and I also... I'm afraid not, Miss Harrison. I must ask you to remain exactly where you are. But why? Oh, please do as Mr. Holmes requests, Annie. I I'm sure he knows best. Oh, very well. well. Perhaps Watson might stay and keep you company. Oh, delighted. Uh -huh. <laughs> excellent, excellent. It's just over here, Mr. Holmes. A moment, if you please. 
You see, why choose that particular room? Well, I should have thought that either of the other two windows would have had more attraction for a burglar. Perhaps I was the target, not the room. Yeah, perhaps, perhaps. Well, let's have a look at this fence. Here, what do you think? Mm, it's broken, all right. You think this was done last night? It looks rather old, does it not? Possibly, I expect. Yeah. No marks of anyone jumping down the other side. Ah, fancy we shall get no help here. Shall we return to the hut? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, take my arm, please. Oh, thank you. Uh, I shall go on ahead. I need to agree some things with Dr. Watson. And so you see, the wedding was planned for the late autumn. But now... Oh, don't worry, Miss Harrison. Holmes won't let you down. <laughs> I don't know another man I would trust more if my head were on the block. Oh! Well, I hope you don't think marriage is like putting your head in a block. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not what I think. Miss Harrison, oh. you must remain here where you are for the rest of the day. Let nothing prevent you. Do not leave this place. It's of the utmost importance. Will you do as I ask? Well, certainly, if you so yes, wish. Yes, stay until bedtime, and when you retire, lock the door of this room on the outside and keep the key by you at all times. Promise to do this and to tell no one. Oh, but, Percy... You will come to London with us. Hmm? Oh, uh, all right. I, I promise. Good. Here we are. Well, Annie, I've decided to stop playing the great detective and leave it to the man who knows. <laughs> so, uh, Mr Holmes, what do you propose? What Holmes proposed was that Phelps accompany us back to London in order to help us with the main line of our inquiries. And so, in the early evening, the three of us prepared to set off back to town. What was the object of my friend's manoeuvres? Was it to keep the lady away from Phelps or him away from her? The train arrived on time, but as Holmes put Phelps and I into our carriage, he had one more surprise to play. Well, goodbye, Watson. See you in the morning. What? One or two small points to clear up here, so I intend to stay behind. But uh, where do I take Phelps? Baker Street, your old room. I shall join you at breakfast time. But what about our inquiries in London? Tomorrow. But, uh, but in that case, you might tell them at Briar Bray I shall not return until tomorrow evening. Oh, I don't expect to be in communication with Briar Bray for some time. <laughs> A safe journey, Watson. I hope supper's up to your usual standards. Goodbye, Holmes. Well, Tadpole, that's a turn-up for the book. if you desired a cup of cocoa before retiring. Oh, no, I shall go straight to bed. Good night. Good night, Miss Harrison. To bed, to bed, so sleepy yet. Tarry a while, so slow. You ought to try to rest, my dear fellow. Oh, I cannot. I cannot, Watson. My, my head's spinning. Do you think Holmes can rescue me? Oh, I've seen him do some remarkable things. Has he ever brought to light anything quite so dark as this? Oh, yes. The darkness. I can feel it waiting. It's waiting on the edge of my thoughts. Oh, well, keep it out there where it belongs. Yes. Yes, of course. You're right. Hmm. There's some newfangled theories about the mind of man. Some people think it's like the ocean. Calm enough on the surface, but underneath. Uh, here be dragons, black, ugly monsters lurking in the depths. Really? Yes. So you make sure that you sail your boat on the top of the waves. I shall. You're a good man, Watson. Yes, that's what Holmes always says. I rather think he means reliable. <laughs> like a watch. Where is he, I wonder, Holmes? Oh, he'll be out there somewhere. He's not afraid of the dark, or monsters. He's walked through the valley and come out the other side. Good evening. It's been wearisome here in the dark. 
But all's well that ends well. Don't you think? I slept fitfully that night and arose at seven to find Phelps already up, haggard and spent after a sleepless time of it. At eight o'clock, we saw a hansom dash up to the door and Holmes get out of it. His left hand was swathed in a bandage and his face was grim and pale. This case of yours, Mr. Phelps, it's one of the darkest I've ever investigated. I feared it might be beyond you. That bandage tells of adventures, Holmes. What's happened? After something to eat, my dear Watson. Uh, I suppose there's been no answer to the advertisement for the cabman. No, none, I'm afraid. No. Uh, we cannot expect to win every time. Excuse me, I must instruct Mrs. Hudson for breakfast. He looks like a beaten man. No, not at all. <laughs> the clue to the matter probably lies here. In town. I put so much hope in him. Ah, curried chicken. Now, Mrs. Hudson's cuisine might be a trifle limited, but she has as good an idea of breakfast as a Scotch woman. <laughs> what do you have there, Watson? Oh, um, ham and eggs. Oh, yes, excellent. And what's under the dish before you, Mr. Phelps? Not very hungry, really. Yeah, but Watson and I may wish to know the third choice for breakfast. No, be so good as to raise the cover. Oh, uh, yes, yes, of course. Oh, my God. Good Lord. A treaty. How wonderful. The treaty. Uh, how wonderful life could be. Had the brandy, Watson. Look, still in. I've still got it. I won't let it go this time. Hold it tight. Hold it tight. There, 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 there. Oh. Thank, thank you, Watson. I drink this. Oh, drink oh, this. Thank you. Oh. Oh. It was too bad to oh. spring it on you like this, but Watson here knows I can never resist a touch of the dramatic. Even if it means a near heart attack. Oh, nonsense, Mr. Phelps. is in splendid shape. I was talking about myself, Holmes. <laughs> oh, really, sometimes I think of it. <laughs> Oh, never mind. <laughs> oh, God bless you. God bless you, uh, Mr. Holmes. You've saved my honour. Well, my own was at stake as well, you know. Now, come on, Holmes. Tell us the story. Breakfast can wait. <laughs> my goodness, Watson. Your appetite for the facts more than ham and egg. Please, Mr. Holmes. Oh, very well, very well, very well. So, after the station, I wandered around in some very charming countryside until just after sunset I found myself on the road outside Briarbury. I then clambered over the fence into the grass. Well, surely the gate was open. Yes, but Holmes has a peculiar taste in these matters. <laughs> exactly. I watched Miss Harrison sitting in your room reading by the table. At ten o'clock she retired, shut the door and turned the key in the lock. The key? Yes, I had given her instructions to do so and she carried them out to the letter. After twenty or so minutes, I entered your room in much the same manner as the thief had the previous night and waited. Waited through the long night. Just like the speckled bag. Yes, but for another kind of snake. At last, I heard the catch in the window being forced once more. Up went the window and a figure entered the room. The carpet was pulled aside, a floorboard levered up and the papers brought out. My God, you mean that during these ten long weeks of agony the papers were within my reach all the time? I'm afraid so. But who was the thief, Holmes? Who? Well, as I've said before, Mr. Phelps, I can never resist the dramatic. All's well that ends well. Don't you think? How the devil... A mere deduction, dear sir. A simple enough matter for the great detective, eh? I also did some checking up in the city this morning. You've not exactly been successful in your dabbling with stocks and shares, have you, Mr. Harrison? In fact, you've lost and lost heavily. As is many another. But not many another would ruin his sister's happiness and a friend's reputation in order to better his squalid fortune. That was desperate. Yes, so is the shark when hungry and you share its ruthless qualities. Now hand those papers over on the instant. You'll have to take them from me, Holmes. Oh, dear me. You're a little overweight to issue out those sort of challenges, don't you think? No, I think not. No. Yeah. First blood to me. Yeah. The second blood, they tell me, is a far more effective contribution. <laughs> and after that, he was more than willing to hand over the papers. Though he did look a, a trifle murderously at me, and through the one eye with which it was possible to do so. Joseph, a villain and a thief. 
I can hardly believe it. I'm afraid his character is deeper and more dangerous than one might judge from appearance. How did you come on to him, Holmes? Well, I'd already begun to suspect Joseph from the fact that you, Mr. Phelps, had intended to travel home with him on the night in question and that therefore it was likely that he would call in for you on the way. I assume he'd done this before. Yes. Yes, and then when I heard that someone had tried to break into that particular bedroom and when I considered also that the attempt was made on the first night when the nurse was absent, showing the intruder to be well acquainted with the ways of the house, my suspicion turned to certainty. How blind I've been. Now, the facts of the case, as far as I can work them out, are these. Joseph entered the office from the Charles street door and walked straight to your room. Moments after you'd left, finding no one, he promptly rang the bell, but as he did so, his eye fell upon the treaty. He recognised it as a state document of immense value, and in an instant thrust it into his pocket and was gone. He had just enough time to make his escape. Yes, of course. Well, it took a few moments for poor Tangy to tell me the bell was from my room. Mm, indeed. And I, I may ask you to use your influence on his behalf some time later, but let us continue. Joseph returned at once to Woking, and in the secrecy of his room examined his prize. He could see at once there was a, a long price to be had from it, so he concealed it with the intention of selling it to the highest bidder a few days later. Then your sudden return. He's bundled out of the room, and from then on there were always at least two people between him and the treaty. Oh, that must have maddened him. Then he thought he saw his chance. Yes, well, the night he broke in, I'd not taken my usual sleeping draught. Mm, otherwise, he might have succeeded. So, knowing he would repeat the attempt whenever he deemed it safe, I arranged for you to leave, Miss Harrison to stay there all day to forestall him, then retire, leaving the room empty, except for the odd nocturnal visitor. <laughs> the shame all this will bring on Annie and her family. Well, perhaps not. All I was after was the treaty. And having got it, I let my man go. Huh? But why, in heaven's name? Well, it saves embarrassment all round for the government, Lord Holdhurst, and perhaps even Mr. Percy Phelps here. Thank you, Holmes. And for Annie as well. But it does seem as if Harrison got off rather lightly. Oh, not lightly, Watson. Now listen to me, you wretched, squirming creature. <laughs> the affairs of state dictate that your prosecution would cause more trouble and vexation than it's worth. But at any time in the future, all the details can be handed over to Forbes of Scotland Yard, and then you'd find yourself in prison for a considerable amount of time. Do you understand me? Yes. yes thank you, Mr. Oh, Holmes. Don't you thank me, Harrison. Look at me. Look. Look in my eyes. Believe what I say. One error, one slight little strain from the path, and I shall crush you underfoot as I would a slug on a damp autumn day. I have put my mark on you, Master Joseph, and you will carry it till the day you die. No, I wouldn't say lightly. Well then, Mr. Phelps, now there can be no obstacle between you and the uh, forthright Miss Harrison. I don't really know how to thank you, Holmes. Perhaps you'd like to come to the wedding. Annie and I would be oh, so pleased. Oh, no, 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 thank you, no. no. Both weddings and funerals I avoid whenever possible. Oh, come now, Holmes. No, but Watson here will attend, I'm sure. In fact, he's the very man to give you any advice you may require on the matter, <clears> since he's made such a, a grand success of his own matrimonial dealings. Well, it makes a nice change from dealing with you for all these years. <laughs> <laughs> and do you have any advice for me, Watson? Well... Marriage is not unlike a treaty between two countries, one foreign to the other. You agree on the details, get it drawn up in a language you both understand, then sign the thing. But for goodness sake, Phelps, don't lose it this time. <laughs> <laughs> now, let's have the breakfast. <laughs> In The Naval Treaty, Sherlock Holmes was played by Clive Merrison and Dr. Watson by Michael Williams with Patrick Malahide as Percy Phelps. Annie Harrison was played by Joanna Myers, Joseph Harrison by Stephen Tompkinson, Inspector Forbes by David Bannerman, Lord Holdhurst by Brett Usher, Mr. Tangy by Norman Jones, and Miss Tangy by Petra Markham. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The violinist was Leonard Friedman. The Naval Treaty was dramatised for radio by David Ashton and directed by Patrick Rayner.